So my question for you is, you know, what are some of the best practices for reducing variability with, without introducing the massive regulatory burden, right, of performance testing each lot? From, you know, it goes back to um, establishing your uh, desired attributes of your product. Uh, what do you expect that product to be? What's your proposed mechanism of actions? So it's about being able to, um, as you go into your regulatory submissions, to build in the understanding that you have of that variability and how you intend to react to it. Um, you can't control everything. Uh, I think it plays a little bit of, of incorporating what you learn as you go along. Of course, you've got phase development. You've got your pre-ID, you've got your ID, and you've got your phase one, phase two B, A's and B's, and so on. Um, expectations grow along the curve. Understanding what's expected uh, early on is important. The agency is amicable to less tight expectations or specifications of your release testing. Uh, what is important is to, as you start your studies, is to build in a lot of, for information only testing that you're trying to learn about your product. You have, uh, let's just say you expect a certain number of CD3 cells and you dose based on that, uh, 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 based on your um, uh, positive, uh, target specific positive CD3 cells. But you need to know and understand more of that. And so you build in the assays for FIO uh, for information only that you learn across the way. And as you learn more about that, you do annual updates and you say to the agency, this is what we've learned. This is what we now we're tightening our specifications. And obviously, as you progress through clinical trials, you learn more and more. So maintaining that data set and mining that data set, it, it's easy to say, okay, here's all our data, but you've got to constantly be mining that data set. Look, what is it telling you? What is your information that you can learn? and you build into your regulatory submissions algorithms. You can say, if I see this, then I do that. But if I see this, I do that. And building in algorithms into the manufacturing process is quite acceptable with the agency and is an important thing in cell and gene therapy. Um, unlike the traditional biologics where you have a recipe, as Umkar mentioned, you have a recipe, you, follow, you get the same results at the end. You have control of the all incoming reagents and consumables that you use in the process. Cell therapy is gray. It's going to stay gray for a while. It's not black and white by the nature of the business that we do. So being able to build into your regulatory submissions and your understanding that if I see this, then this is what I'm going to do. And, and the agency is quite accepting of that. So long as you've got the data to support that and that it does still give you the same product yield at the end. If I, um, and for the simple reason, I'll go back for the simple red cell. And if I get a patient with a lot of immature reds, I'm going to use a red cell lysis in my logo process to clean those red cells up. But I've gotten the data to show that X, Y, and Z. The same thing with the in-process testing. If we see X, we know what we need to do versus if we see Y, we do something different. And it's usually around different feed schedules. If you've got the data to support that and you're mining that data that can change over time, change across patient populations, and or even disease entities, then maintaining that dialogue and interaction with the agency becomes important. Uh, so the use of algorithms uh, uh, to guide you through your manufacturing process uh, is hugely important. It's um, a little bit cleaner with allogeneic than it is autologous, um, and that at least you start working with the same donor pools that you're going through with allo. Um, the, the greater variability is with the autologous products. So.